I can remember to uh, record. So we are now recording. Um, so today we'll be diving into email deliverability and some best practices around um, and as they relate to avoiding the spam filter. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris Arendelle from Trendline Interactive. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you today? Hey, good. Thank you very much for having me and look forward to discussing the ins and outs of deliverability and helping to answer some questions. Excellent. Yeah. And, and so, Chris, if you wouldn't mind first telling us a little bit about your background, but I, I also have a special request from an email on Asset Executive who shall remain nameless. So I'm going to throw you a curveball right off the bat here, Chris. So if you could just give us a little bit about your background. And also, he said, could you describe your current footwear? <laughs> I figured that was going to be the question. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, I'm, I'm currently the Chief Privacy Officer at Trendline Interactive. Um, I had a company that I started five years ago called Inbox Pros that was acquired by Trendline a year ago. Uh, I've been in the email space for, for uh, gosh, over 16 years. I um, started working with law firms back in the day on email marketing, uh, transitioned to multiple ESPs, places like Silverpop, some startup ESPs, um, been working for multiple agencies. Uh, and then really focused on the deliverability, privacy, and compliance uh, section of email marketing, really just to figure out the, um, you know, again, what's, uh, what's keeping some emails from getting into the inbox, troubleshooting, helping to increase open rates, click rates, conversion rates, um, also helping marketers understand what the ISPs want uh, and help them kind of, you know, understand the, hey, you can't keep your list forever. You know, there's ways that you have to, um, you know, segment, there's best practices, there's ways that you can help yourself and it's not always, you know, the fault of any tool or any ESP. Perfect. And then footwear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, cur I'm, I'm currently wearing uh, um, dress shoes, but oftentimes I usually wear uh, crazy uh, flower shoes. I have uh, some Lady Gaga gold spike shoes. Uh, I just acquired some Jeremy Scott's. They actually have wings on them. And so I'll gladly share a picture of those later on if we have time. Oh, I'm really sorry I brought it up. <laughs> Thanks for that. No um, problem. So I guess before we jump into the topic, um, I, I think it's important to define what we mean by deliverability. You know, I guess looking the difference between deliverability and delivery, right? You know, for me, in my mind, I'm very visual. I see I see delivery as my mail was, was sent to my house, right? It made it to my house, great. But maybe the wind blew it into the bushes. So it was delivered, yeah, it didn't exactly make it into the inbox. You know, would you mind expanding or taking a minute to expand upon the difference between deliverability and delivery? Yeah, no problem. I think that's um, it's definitely something a lot of marketers still have a problem with. Um, you know, we work with clients and they'll say things like, my, my deliverability rate is 95%. Uh, and you're like, well, where did you come up with that number? And they're you know, like, well, I looked at it in my report uh, from the ESP, and it says that I have 95% deliverability when it means delivery, right? So sent minus bounced equals delivered. And so delivered is when the recipient's mail server, the other side accepts the mail, then of course it's marked as delivered, right? It's that 250 OK handshake that says, hey, you know, transaction, transaction successfully delivered, email delivered, but then, what happens afterwards is ultimately up to multiple filters, multiple rules, uh, definitions, and really what's happening at the recipient's mail server end or filter end. Um, so it could be sent to the junk folder of the recipient. It could be sent to quarantine, which oftentimes, especially as we troubleshoot B2B senders, the quarantine folder on the firewall or the mail filter is oftentimes where it lands and understanding that to work with IT to figure out why it did so. And then the other thing too is, you know, from a deliverability perspective, it's not just, you know, know, inbox versus spam versus missing. It's also, again, you know, reasons why the emails bounced, right? So again, your delivered rate is the sent minus bounce equals delivered. Your deliverability rate is, of course, helping to make sure those emails reach the inbox. There is no tool out there in the history of the universe that will tell you exactly the number of emails that got delivered to the inbox, the number that got delivered to the junk folder, and the number that got delivered to quarantine or missing, right? So there is no tool out there. There's multiple tools that are available, uh, you know, seed list tools, panel data tools, spam filter tools, checks, things like that, to kind of troubleshoot and figure out, hey, are we having a content filter problem, a reputation problem, an engagement problem, a blacklist problem? There's all sorts of tools that will tell you that. But ultimately, one thing that you want to take a look at and sort of 
baseline yourself, right? Because oftentimes they get the question of, hey, what should my uh, open rate be? Um, and of course, you know, if you can make up a random number and people say, okay, that's great. That's not the case, right? You need to look at your email program. You need to, to look at the baseline of your program and figure out what your optimal open and click rate should be. I, I see way too many times um, charts that come out that say, hey, if you're in the insurance division, you should have a 20% open rate. If you're in the transportation, if you're in the consumer, the problem with that is that everybody's list is different, content's different, you know, segmentation, volume. There's so many different factors that you really can't put a factor or, or put your thumb on that. But again, striving toward, you know, a good open click rate, a good delivery rate, a good deliverability rate is possible with, you know, again, list health, right? List health is definitely uh, is key for deliverability, making sure that you have a low bounce rate, a low complaint rate, and a low unsubscribe rate. Oftentimes during a IP warming phase, we often will see maybe a higher bounce rate or a higher unsubscribe rate or maybe a higher complaint rate, right? Because lots of factors could be that your emails are finally starting to get to the inbox. People are seeing them and saying, well, why do I need this? I don't remember signing up. Um, but again, an unsubscribe rate that's high tells you something, right? It's, it's an indicator. Uh, an unsubscribe rate that's, that's high over 1% oftentimes will, is a meaning of this content doesn't look right. I didn't sign up for this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not hit with the offer I was expecting. And same thing for complaint, right? If I can't find your um, unsubscribe link, um, if there is no unsubscribe link, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, hitting that complaint button, that's what really hurts the sender's, you know, deliverability and reputation. Too many complaints can have issues and each ISP is going to have their own standards and sets to say, hey, you know, strive for this many complaints or don't go above this much. But having some complaints is good. I always tell people like, hey, you know, you can't complain if you're in the junk folder, you know, because there's no spam button, right? Because you're already in the junk folder. But having some complaints is an indicator of inbox placement. And so it's a healthy, you know, sort of standard of meaning, but not having too much, right? Not blowing it out. And that's the biggest thing that marketers don't understand is that, you know, we'll work with clients that say, well, I haven't had a complaint in a year. Well, it's a few things, right? Maybe you're not signed up for all available feedback loops, which, you know, the uh, ISPs have as far as uh, complaints go. Uh, or it could be that your emails are going straight to the junk folder. And so there's lots of testing that goes along with it. Uh, but having a good, um, you know, delivered rate helps you understand the deliverability rate, but optimize for your uh, sort of baseline for opens and clicks. Yeah, like that. If no one's complaining, perhaps nobody's getting the email. <laughs> Sometimes a little yeah. feedback is good. Well, at least they're getting it. Then we can make adjustments. Yep. Um, I, and one thing I want to touch upon, and because we get this a lot of email and acid when they will, they'll, um, a, a customer will come in and run a spam test and say, hey, listen, uh, what's a good deliverability rate? I mean, we want to get to 100%, right? And I think it is important to note that it's just 100% deliverability is, is literally impossible based on the second bullet point that we have up on the slide here, you know, e email client updates and, and address changes. 100% is, is, just, is not going to happen, but you do want to get up into the 90s for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excellent. So no, I, I, thank you so much for, for talking through the difference between deliverability versus delivery. I think it really helps set up the conversation moving forward. So next, and you, you know, it's funny, you, you laid out a lot of teasers for what we're going to discuss today on the webinar, which is, which is really good. Um, so now that we've defined the difference or what we mean by deliverability, let's look at some strategies for increasing inbox placement. First, let's talk about the importance of your subscription list. You know, why is it so important to have a good list? And, and what are some best practices here regarding a good list? Absolutely. So, you know, of course, the first bullet point there is double opt-in, which I also sometimes refer to it as chief revenue killer. Right, because of course, a double opt-in is, is great for deliverability. And I'll tell you from a, putting my deliverability hat on, having a, a list that's, uh, you know, again, double opt-in is going to help, again, with lower complaints, lower unsubscribes, higher opens, higher clicks. But oftentimes, maybe you're missing out on certain subscribers or recipients, depending upon your program. Maybe, again, that, that you know, confirmation that uh, the confirmed opt-in is going to be um, more expected of, of the business. Um, you know, just making sure that it's clean, compliant, making sure that you're removing bounces. Uh, you know, hard bounces usually oftentimes are, are removed immediately from the ESP. Soft bounces, there's a retry schedule in each ESP. Uh, marketing automation provider will have its own set of rules and say, hey, I'm going to retry this bounce three times once a day for the next three days. Afterwards, it's going to come back and then you're going to have to deal with that. Um, one thing that people don't look at uh, with their bounces and with their list um, are the mailbox fulls. 
Um, oftentimes people don't look at that and they're sending to mailbox full bounces for months and months and months when that's an indicator, a possible indicator that that person is, you know, again, abandoned that account, right? Think of everybody had an AOL account back in the day and you know, how many people are still using that, right? So, and, and think about Gmail with the number, with the amount of storage that they give you. Um, you know, just keeping it uh, fresh and segmented, uh, segmentation is key. Um, you know, you've got a VIP list that you may send, you know, more often. Uh, you may, again, during the opt-in process, tell your subscribers, hey, listen, I'm going to send you uh, two emails a week, and I want you to abide by that, right? You know, having that expectation set up front. When you start to have uh, emails that are three, four, or five times a week, you, you kind of overstepped your bounds, and that's when people are going to hit the complaint button or the unsubscribe. So adhering to that, helping them understand what emails you're going to send them, I have a good story. I was, uh, it was probably about a year ago now. I uh, was going to go to Home Depot as we had just moved into a new house. Um, and of course, you know, you sign up for Home Depot's uh, email list. They'll give you a coupon. And I signed up and then I got an email back that said, you know, thanks for signing up. You'll get your coupon in the next three days, which killed me, right? Because I know I want to go right now, right? I, wanna, I, want, I want to use this now. So it's a, um, you know, again, it's an expectation of why people signed up. And oftentimes people will just sign up for the offer. Uh, just sign up for, you know, some sort of benefit and then just kind of go away. And uh, we see that a lot with what we call burner email addresses. So everybody, you know, has heard about the burner cell phone. Most people probably on this webinar have a burner email address, right? An email address that you just use for email marketing purposes or buying things and need a receipt, signing up for newsletters. Um, and you can see that engagement slowly dwindle at places like uh, Gmail and Microsoft. Um, so again, the unengaged, right? So you know, people say, well, what's the most optimal unengaged sort of methodology I can use on my list as far as segmentation goes? And the answer is really, it depends because of things like seasonality, right? So if you're a seasonality business once, twice, three times a year, you can't remove unengaged subscribers that haven't opened or clicked in six months. There is no one size fits all. It's based upon your business, seasonality, um, sort of your sending patterns, what you're selling. I work with a client that sells, you know, $100,000 uh, dental x-ray machines, right? How often are you going to be sending those emails? Right. Um, I've, I've worked with automotive companies that say, no, we want to send at least once a week. Well, what are you sending, right? The person bought the car. It better be things like service and maintenance and coupons and things no, like warranty. that. Yep. Exactly. It better not be, a, you know, an offer for a new car. <laughs> so having, so having, looking at the unengaged, looking at the bounces, but segmentation again, right? So, uh, okay, I don't want to get rid of people that have not opened or clicked in 12 months. Well, let's figure out what that means. Is there a certain section of that list that, you know, maybe has different offers or needs different offers? Or can we go back to maybe 18 months? But what happens is the, the further you go out, you start to run the risk of things, uh, of spam traps, uh, of, of possible blacklist issues, right, for hitting those traps. You run the risk of, um, Again, higher bounce rates, because if people have abandoned that account, you'll see some higher soft bounces, higher hard bounces. And again, those are indicators, not just for blacklist and reputation and filtering companies, but also the ISPs. They look at that and they're saying, okay, well, this client is sending from this IP address and this domain, and they keep hitting all these hard bounces, all these soft bounces, they get all, get all these complaints. What's really going on, right? And so again, from an engagement perspective, you want to keep those optimal just for places like, again, Gmail, Microsoft, a lot of these places look at that and they really kind of gauge you based upon what you're doing. Right. Um, yeah. yep. And list size, right? Um, I had a conversation size a few weeks ago. Size does matter here, right? <laughs> Not <laughs> well, necessarily a, large. Right. Well, I had a conversation a few weeks ago and this client said, well, my um, advertiser won't spend money with me unless my list size is over a million. Hmm. Right. So it's the old methodology. People still have that methodology of, hey, I'm not going to spend money, money with you as an advertiser or whatever as a banner ad um, unless your list is over a million because I want that reach. Problem is, is that, OK, you send to a million, but maybe 10 percent are actually seeing it. Right. I would much rather have a larger amount of opens, clicks, conversions than a list. Right. That list size can be 100,000. But if I'm getting a 40 percent open rate, a 30 percent click rate and a high conversion rate, I would much rather have that than sending to a million and getting single digit numbers. Sure. Well, we'll get to reputation, engagement and so forth here in a minute. But that's that's really where all this comes into play. Um, so excellent. Um, well, speaking of <laughs> the next item, I, I think we did, you did an amazing job really detailing the 
the importance of a good subscription list. Uh, so, so we have a good list. The, the question now is, um, you know, good content leads to an engaged audience, right? I, I spent some time in the classroom and I can tell you right now that when I was standing in front of a classroom of seventh graders, if my content wasn't engaging and relevant, you know, I'm going to lose them instantly. And I knew pretty quickly. And I do think this applies to email marketing as well. So Chris, if we have a good list, you know, how important is the content? And I guess what, what really defines good content? Yeah, I often tell clients that, listen, you're going to get uh, a few bites of the apple, but that's pretty quickly, right? So you're going to look at when people open up their email, they can see the from name, they can see who the sender is, right? So making sure that's consistent, it's a brand that I identify with, that's important. But then that subject line, right? So it's engaging. Uh, there's a lot of studies out there that say, you know, if you're a B2C sender, shorter subject lines are better. If you're a B2B sender, longer subject lines are better, right? But it depends upon your audience, depends upon what you're typically used to sending, right? So you don't want to get too involved, but, but tagging them and, and, and trying to get them engaged very quickly. Emoticons are, are still, you know, people still use that, again, from a deliverability perspective. I don't see a lot of issues with that. One thing that may come into play as more, um, you know, people, hopefully not, but a lot of people still use, um, you know, the Amazon Alexa, the Google Home, when they try to read the subject line, of course, it's trying to read that HTML code for the emot emoticons, so that's, that's a little problematic. Um, uh, clean HTML, that's key, right? I mean, making sure that the HTML isn't broken, because again, if, if, if a sender, or if, if I receive an email from a sender, and the images are broken, maybe they're, the format's off, the columns are broken, the wraps don't look good, I may think this is a phishing email, right? Or I may hit the spam button because this is not typical of what you normally send me. Um, and, and of course, there's lots of, lots of different sort of best practices when it comes to HTML, right? Make sure you don't have a single image mailing, make sure there is a good mix of image to text, you know, make sure you do have a pre-header Right, that pre-header text is great because it does render in iOS, so that, that way it's right below the subject line, it's that first line. Um, having that's important because again, oftentimes, um, you know, it'll say things like, you know, view, uh, view uh, email and, and website like, and, as right. the uh, pre-header, which is horrible. That's a, that's a, it's a bad customer experience. Um, I oftentimes tell people too, we've, we've run into a lot of issues with uh, senders that actually put uh, comments in their HTML uh, comments in the HTML can uh, fluff the HTML. It can definitely make it larger. Uh, but also, too, oftentimes comments include um, curse phrases, curse words, misspelled words, uh, problematic terms that can really be uh, problematic during the filtering and rendering time, right? So making sure that comments are, are turned off or cleaned up accordingly. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit last time about, you know, Gmail, right? Gmail may clip an email it's over 102 kilobytes in size and so having your clean html your images you know you know smaller uh cleaned up will help with that because of course one thing that make it cut off at the very bottom at gmail would be that unsubscribe link which you know people then start hitting the spam button um, it's funny, you, you, nice clean streamlined html i mean it's such a it, it it seems like um common sense but you know we we often see these really big heavy emails come in that that really need some i think it's because what happens is sometimes they get a template like this happens all the time an agency has a template that they use over and over again and perhaps they keep adding to and then nope. then they test it and send it out and it just gets larger and larger and larger but really streamlining that html is important yeah but you know i think too a lot a lot of clients will say well you know what does that mean and what can i do and i think you know having testing scenarios looking to see how it renders on mobile uh, people oftentimes forget about plain text, making sure that your plain text is buttoned up. We had an issue, it's been about three years ago, where the plain text version was not, um, did, basically the HTML did not copy uh, correctly over to the plain text. And the offer that was on the plain text was better. It was an older offer. And so when people did receive the plain text version, they were you know, asking for that offer. And it can be problematic. Um, I have seen some cool stuff, though, with uh, certain brands that will actually hide coupon codes in HTML. Uh, that makes it pretty fun from like a scavenger hunt perspective, uh, but making sure that you are, you know, testing, make sure that you do have the rendering, especially for places like Microsoft Outlook. Everybody on this call, uh, I'm sure, and even at email and assets, like, listen, Microsoft Outlook is painful, right? Especially with 2019, especially with all the different changes that are coming up. So again, testing for that, making sure it is optimal, especially for the B2B senders uh, on that side. Um, and last but not least, I have what I call deliverability branding. This is something that I've, I've spoken about for a long time. 
Um, deliverability branding is making sure that you're consistent with your brand from a from name perspective, from you know not just the subject line, but also from the copy perspective, right? So uh, you can't be changing names all the time because people look at that from name and they're like, who is that, right? right. Unless you're on B2B, oftentimes for B2B, they're expecting probably an email from their account manager, from their salesperson, whatever the case may be. But if you're, you know, especially on the consumer side, if you're trying to sell your brand or sell a product, having that consistent branding on the from name is very important. The branding inside the message, the branding inside the footer, all of that is very important because, you know, recipients are looking for that consistency. Once they start to see big changes, um, it can, it can be problematic. Uh, we were working with a brand uh, last year and they changed uh, uppercase H to a lowercase H in their from name. Uh, and they actually had a very bad day at Yahoo and AOL. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, think again, so right? many people think it might be the yeah, phishing scam or something's changed, right? You, you, you get used to consistency and suddenly it changes. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Excellent. All right. So, so the list is good. The content's good. Now the big question is, are our subscribers engaged and what happens if they're not? So a, a really big question is how does a lack of engagement impact deliverability or, or does it? Yeah. So um, engagement is, is definitely key, right? It's a term I labeled the walking dead is basically a mailbox that uh, nobody's doing anything with. They're not opening, they're not clicking, they're not saving, they're not sending emails. Uh, Gmail, Microsoft, ISPs can tell what those mailbox are doing, uh, especially if you're trying to set up or trying to trick the filters at places like Gmail. And I'm just going to create 100 Gmail accounts and go in and try to open and click and save and do these things. Uh, Gmail knows that, right? They can see, uh, you know, login IP, login destination is a desktop versus mobile, what you're actually doing inside there. Um, there are some things that marketers can measure, but there are a lot, of, lot more things that ISPs can measure. So marketers, of course, inside their ESP or inside their marketing automation platform can look at things like opens, clicks, um, possibly replies, if that's set up, you know, the reply management within the ESP, complaints, again, depending upon the, uh, the ISP themselves if they offer that. But a lot of the ISPs can look at things like, you know, did the person scroll to the bottom? How long did they read the email? Did they open it on mobile versus desktop? Did they mark it as not spam? Right. You know, did they actually do something to, to really benefit you? Uh, there are a lot of things that, you know, again, ISPs are measuring what they call engagement, but marketers really can only measure a few of those things. And that's why list segmentation is important to the whole engagement algorithm. But understanding, again, the audience and sort of like that expectation is just like a it's, it's a breath of fresh air. Right. When everything kind of comes together. You know, again, this, the, you, you get those opens, you get those clicks, you get those conversions, but helping to understand it's not just list, it's not just content, it's also that engagement, you know, bounce management. There's a lot of things in this deliverability formula and having all those set up properly, especially from the beginning, will help you tremendously. Right. Um, you know, again, uh, we, we do a lot of work with clients and one thing that we do the, um, to help sort of engagement or help to encourage that uh, is encouraging people to reply, right? So they receive an email, from a brand and that brand may say reply now for a VIP coupon code, you know, reply now for feedback, right? And, and monitoring those replies. Uh, monitoring replies are really important because, you know, not just from a can spam perspective, if somebody replies, you know, remove me, opt me out, unsubscribe, but also reply back and say, I'd like to order a thousand laptops, right. right? If you weren't monitoring that reply mailbox, you're, you're missing out, right? Not just from a, uh, compliance perspective, but also from possible sales perspective. Sure. Um, very, very important. Uh, and complaints, um, complaints are a form of engagement. It's a negative form of engagement, but it is something that the recipient is actually doing. Uh, but there are some ISPs, the, the biggest one, of course, is Gmail that does not offer a traditional feedback loop, right? So when somebody hits the spam button at Gmail, the ESP doesn't know that, which means you don't know that, right? So you can, you know that the uh, the complaint, the person who actually hit the spam button, future emails are going to go straight to the junk folder. But, you know, again, that's that form of segmentation. So if somebody hasn't opened or clicked at Gmail within a certain period of time, you have to start looking at that and figure out like, okay, the last time they opened or clicked was six months ago. Should we figure out a different message to send them? Do we stop sending to them? Do we send them, you know, different types of uh, engagement, right? Um, one thing that's very important, I think that, um, we haven't really talked about is 
uh, the unsubscribe page and the preference page, right? So having a preference center so that people can opt down versus opting out, uh, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, some people just don't like email and they like social media. So I always encourage clients to have the, you know, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, uh, you know, pin us on Pinterest, right? So those are additional ways that you can grow your brand, grow your audience without having to worry about engagement. If somebody wants off your email list, they're gonna get off of it one way or the other, whether it right. be an unsubscribe, a complaint, uh, a reply that says remove me now. But again, maybe they're interested via social media. So they're still a brand ambassador, they're still a brand uh, advocate, but they're just not getting the emails. Yeah, I like that you're painting the big picture here how, yeah, the subscription list is really important, content's important, engagement's important, but it's really each piece is a puzzle. It's, it's a piece of a puzzle to a bigger picture. Um, and when it's all working together, you know, that's the sweet spot that everyone's looking for. Yeah. Um, so great. We are definitely covering all our bases, but you know, there are, of course, there are other things to consider, lots of other things to consider, um, such as authentication, infrastructure, DMARC, BIMI. Would you mind just touching a little bit on each piece here um, as they fall into this, this big puzzle we're talking about? Absolutely. So this, you know, the, the authentication piece, right? This is something that oftentimes your ESP will set up for you or they'll give you certain DNS records to do. Uh, the first one is SPF, Sender Policy Framework. SPF was sort of the original um, way to help understand authentication via IP authentication, which says, hey, you're allowed to send off of these IPs, your ESP provides you that information, you make a DNS update, boom, that's good, right? So SPF is still required for all the major ISPs and filtering companies. They still like to have SPF set up. DKIM is Domain Keys Identified Mail. This is more of that domain authentication. Uh, again, places like, you know, again, Gmail, Microsoft, everybody wants DKIM. DKIM is um, essentially the, your ESP keeps the private key. They give you the public key to update in your DNS. When those two come together, the key unlocks the lock, DKIM passes. And again, it's, it's really for a protection of making sure that things aren't changed along the way while the mail is in transit. So having DKIM set up is good for reputation, for engagement, but also again for security and authentication. So those are the two uh, authentication protocols that ESPs will either set up for you, help you set that up, and or give you guidelines on how to do so. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, one thing that is still, a lot of email marketers still have a hard time with is understanding, um, you know, dedicated versus shared, right? There's pros and cons to both, right? Oftentimes, depending upon the uh, ESP that you work with, you may start off in a shared IP or maybe you don't send a lot of volume and you'll just be on a shared IP. It could be one shared IP, it could be 10, could be 20. Uh, you just don't never know depending upon the ESP how many IP addresses they have. With that, you have to understand that being on a shared IP means that you're sharing the reputation uh, of others that are on that shared IP address or IP address pool, which can be good and bad, right? So if you are, um, you know, if you've, uh, got low volume, let's say you're, you don't have as high of engagement, uh, whatever the case may be, maybe that'll help you, maybe that'll boost you up. Yep. Um, but also too, let's say one day you're checking for blacklists and you're like, wait, I'm on a blacklist? How is that possible, right? I didn't do anything. And so then you look and you're like, well, why am I on a blacklist? Well, there's 200 other senders that are on this IP and so one of them may have done it for you. It's important that if you are on a shared IP and it's something you can check with your account manager at the ESP that you work with, uh, it's important to know other senders that are on that shared IP pool, right? So can you tell me other, you know, sending types or groups that are on this IP and is there a way that I can move depending upon how my deliverability is? Whereas dedicated IP is especially suitable for larger senders, right. uh, which is great because that means that you're responsible for your own reputation. Nobody else is going to be responsible for it. So having dedicated means that, you know, essentially you're the only one that, uh, is responsible for things like a blacklist or complaints and whatever the case may be. Um, and then of course domains, right? So having that, having a dom ascending domain set up properly with the authentication records, making sure that it's dedicated just to your brand uh, is very important. Oftentimes we see things like, um, you know, the sending domain may be used by multiple divisions within a company. The problem is from a domain reputation perspective, if sales does something, if HR does something, that's gonna affect what marketing does. Having your own dedicated subdomain off of your main domain is very important from a sending perspective. Places like Gmail and Microsoft, they look at that, right? So if you're all sharing the same domain, you're all sharing the same reputation, right. uh, which is 
can be good and bad depending upon how you like it. But I, I always recommend having a dedicated subdomain just for marketing. Um, and we can go into multiple areas of that, including having different ones for transactional versus marketing. Uh, there's a lot of but things that go into having it really comes down to this, and you and I talked a little bit about this. It comes down to you could be guilty by association, but you could also your reputation could also pull down others. So that's the whole the whole problem with this idea of shared. Um, yeah, it is. Dmark um, essentially Dmark is a uh, a standard that was created when uh, PayPal, Bank of America, Wells Fargo got into a room with Google, Microsoft, and others, and said, "We need a way to combat phishing." Uh, you know, the, these other authentication methods haven't, they didn't go far enough. We need a way to protect against so. And so DMARC is a, uh, a newer authentication protocol that essentially protects your brand against phishing attacks by providing you reports directly from the ISP on anybody else that's using your domain to send email. It's pretty easy to set it up. It's a DNS record. But the problem is, is that once you set the DMARC up, you need a system, you need some way to read those reports. Every ISP is going to send you a separate email with an XML file attachment that you have to open and read and nobody's going to love reading XML, right? So there's multiple systems, uh, places like Demartian, uh, Agari, 250OK, Return Path. They all have readers that you can use for DMARC. The key with DMARC though, it's honestly, it's two, uh, two areas. The first one is um, turning DMARC on will tell you other systems, other ESPs, within your walls that may be using your domain to send email. And so I always tell the story that I was working with a client that they thought they had three ESPs within their walls and we turned DMARC on and they had 18, <laughs> right? Because they turned on constant contact and MailChimp, vertical response and Emma and a lot of other you know, ESPs because sales didn't want to go through marketing, right? So they were like, so salespeople were like, you know, screw this. We're going to go out and get our own system. We're going to use our own list. And the reason we turned DMARC on was you know, for that protection, but to also look at why the domain reputation was dragging at Gmail, right? Because if everybody is using that same domain and they're sending up to purchase list, to old list, you know, an active list, that's gonna bring you down, right? And so that was very important to do so. But the second and most important thing is that brand protection. So having DMARC turned on, you can phase DMARC into a full reject mode, which means that if somebody tries to use your domain to send an email, it will bounce, it will not even be delivered. And those are places like, again, Bank of America, PayPal, Wells Fargo, Uber, Lyft. They all have DMARC turned on to that reject status, which is where you want to be. Um, and then BIMI, I think, is one of the most exciting things to come out, um, you know, especially for the email side is, you know, uh, essentially having a logo next to the name um, of the sender. So you can now, now have, um, you know, your logo via a DNS record. Uh, next to your brand name in email. And of course, Gmail just signed up for that through the beta program. Uh, there's a few other ISPs that have signed up. It's, it's something that's small, that's it's still in beta. It's moving towards uh, actually getting a lot more uh, recognition. But I think it's going to be great because then recipients can see that, hey, that, that logo, I can identify with that as well as the brand name. The great thing about Bimming is that you have to have DMARC turned on to at least a quarantine or reject in order to have that logo show up. Why? That way, if the logo doesn't show up next to the name, you know it's probably phishing. Huh. Interesting. That's that's very good to know. Actually, Bimmy keeps coming up a little bit here and there as it as it grows, but uh, but we are definitely hearing more about it day to day here at Email and Asset. Yeah. Um, so we've talked. Boy, this time is just flying by. <laughs> so we've we've talked a lot about you know what we should do to improve deliverability, but the big question is what are some things to avoid. So if you could just briefly touch on these, um, like I said, we, we keep talking about, it. here's what you do to improve, but just some simple points, right, to of things to avoid. Yeah, and I think some of these two are definitely from a customer experience perspective is also things to avoid, right? So all caps, you don't want to be screaming at your recipients. You don't want to be <laughs> screaming at the ISP to say, hey, you know, flag me now, right? So, uh, and I still see this, especially in a lot of uh, spam emails, the all caps, and not just in the subject line, but also in the body of the email. Um, having caps uh, is fine, just understanding that uh, you, know, you need to test it, make sure that it looks good from a uh, filtering perspective, but just not having caps lock turned on for every piece of text that you're sending out. Um, excessive exclamation points, I see this a lot. Uh, I, I, we were working with a, um, a mortgage broker and they were sending out to um, you know, 
just probably a couple thousand email addresses. But every after every sentence, there were at least three exclamation part, uh, points. Uh, very problematic. Uh, again, it's, it's from a customer experience perspective. You know, why are you screaming and yelling at your recipients? Um, phrases such as call now, act now, now buy now. Uh, you know, one thing that you want to do is, is not stand out and say, hey, look at me. I'm a bulk email marketer. Try to flag me as much as possible, right? There are ways that you want to do that by, again, having your emails look more personal, uh, you know, using things like personalization. You want to avoid the, you know, act now, call now, buy now, um, you know, just for, again, from a customer experience perspective and look like it's more personable. And, you know, what do you want the recipient to do? Is there a, you know, call to action? Is there something that they need to do to move to the next phase? Is it downloading a PDF? Is it going to a landing page to buy something? And again, your recipients, if they're loyal, if they understand you, if they know your content, they're going to do so. Uh, and of course, large list of unengaged and active subscribers, right? You know, you definitely want to avoid that, but there's a lot of ways that you can, um, uh, a lot of things you can do before you get to that level, right? So again, segment now, look at your subscribers. What, do, what are they doing? Are they telling you something, right? Uh, are they not opening or clicking? Are they may, they may be opening, but not clicking, right? So I see that a lot. We see high opens, but low clicks. Why is that? You know, is it a, the link is broken? Is it that, you know, the content itself is not very suitable, right? It could be that the content's ugly um, and people don't want to click on it. They don't want to, they don't want to engage. They don't want to convert. Um, and the first question that I always ask marketers when I work with them is, would you open and click and convert on this email that you're sending? Right. And a lot of times I get, no, I wouldn't do that. It's like, well, think about your recipients, right? You don't want to, you want to kind of mimic the, uh, so what you're doing with, with what you're actually sending out. It's funny. I get a lot of emails. I read a lot of emails on my phone. Unfortunately, that's just a personal issue, but instead of deleting the emails, I'll just open and then close, open, close, open, close. It's just easier to mark them that way, which means it's probably showing up as high open, but low engagement. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny, you know, uh, I've been in the email business for a long time and uh, I met my wife in the email business too as well, but just to kind of watch how people open and click and read emails, it's very interesting because my wife will open every email, mark is read, scroll to the bottom, move it to a folder. I'm like, well, you didn't really read that. She's like, well, I may, I want to make sure that I still get this in my inbox. Right. So it's, uh, you're training. It's almost like you have to train yourself and then understand the behavior to figure out what the recipients actually want to do with your mail. It, that's good. <laughs> Whenever my dog wants to go out or wants a treat, she asks to go out because she knows when she comes and she gets a treat, regardless of what happened outside. Yeah. So it's kind of the same <laughs> thing. Here. No, that's good. So actually, you know, Chris, this is great information. I, I completely forgot. I hate to derail the webinar, but um, I just remembered I've got a campaign that has to go out tomorrow. I ran uh -oh. a spam this morning. And as luck would have it, we have an expert on the call. Um, would you mind just taking a peek at this? Uh, yes, of course. Results with me. So let's uh, jump in here. I've got my buy now with main exclamation points and a little small face. Um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us, uh, reviewing some of these results with me once it comes up here. Uh, here we go. There we go. All right. So, so what stands out to you on this page? Yeah. So besides the subject line, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the biggest things that stands out is that from the from email address, right? So you're trying to send an email from yahoo.com. And what's going to happen is, you know, sending it from an ESP or marketing automation provider, they're not going to allow you to use yahoo.com just from a DMARC perspective, right? So Yahoo uh, has turned DMARC on to what they call a reject status, which means that uh, you're not allowed to send from yahoo.com unless you're authenticated via one of their sending IP addresses. So that sending IP address right there, 66, 163, 190, 146, is not basically, and that's not authenticated so that Yahoo is allowed to send from it. And again, like I said, with DMARC, when you're on reject, it means that nobody else can send using your domain. So if you were to send this out from an ESP right now, if, even if the ESP uh, allowed you to use the yahoo.com address, uh, you would have multiple bounces come back, right? And again, that's because uh, Yahoo is on that, uh, that uh, full reject status. Um, so that's, that's definitely a huge red flag, right? So um, making sure that you do have a branded from address, uh, oftentimes it's the company domain um, you know, or subdomain. That's very important. Uh, Gmail.com right now is not on full reject status. It will be soon. 
Um, but Yahoo uh, is, and of course that's gonna be a problem. Uh, Comcast is also in full reject. Oh, that's good to um, know. The other thing too that stands out is, uh, you know, again, uh, we see some passes over on the right-hand side and we see the, some greens and some blues uh, B2B looks like 100%, B2C is, looks like it's 79, right? So, you know, when you look at some of these scores, one thing you want to do is look at the actual details. Uh, you, again, you can see a spam assassin score of 3.9. Um, and, and again, subject line is all caps. Uh, subject line starts with buy, right? So there's some, um, and even the very bottom, right? The free mail reply, free mail, of course, being Yahoo. Um, spam assassin score of 3.9 is going to be different depending upon the system that you send it to, right? So, um, each ESP has their own spam checker in there. It's typically at spam assassin and it's set to a default status, meaning that the scores aren't changed, scores aren't added, values aren't changed and so forth. If you're a mail server administrator using spam assassin, you're going to make changes to these scores, right? Because if it says subject all caps right now is at 1.6, you may bump that up to a five and then don't allow anything into my network above a three, right? Which means this email will never get delivered. Right. And so you want to take some of these scores with a grain of salt, but they're very informational. These are right there. There are three scores and definitions within spam assassin. You can change. You can take away that by in the subject line. You could take away the all caps and you can use a different from email address and reply to that's easy. You do that right there. You're going to be pretty much at zero, right? Which is great. Um, you can also see against SPF and DKIM passing, um, on the, uh, on the right hand side with a little green pass, which is great. Um, and then you can see again, some of these, right? So some of these fail. So Outlook 2013, 16 and 19, we've talked about this, right? How Outlook is very problematic, uh, especially on their filtering, especially on their, um, you know, what they're doing when the email gets to Microsoft Outlook. Um, oftentimes not, it has to do with not just with content, but also reputation and also that HTML, right? So if you look at the full HTML of this, what does that look like? are the ways that you can change them. So I've got some work to do. That's what you're saying. Yeah, but some of this is, is it's, it's great that it's laid out like this so you can make these changes pretty easily. Exactly, well, thanks for taking a look. All right, I've got some time before I, before I send that out. So I appreciate that. It looks like I've got some adjustments and some additional testing to do. Um, that's, that's often the problem with a lot of email marketers, right? So they, there's, they don't have enough time, their day's full. And so they, um, every email marketer that I talk to is like, I would love to test more. I would love to do more seed testing, more filter testing, uh, AB split testing. Um, it's just the amount of time that, that you have in a day. So, so we, I guess next would be questions. So I want to thank everyone for sending questions. And, and, and Chris and I discussed this a little bit last week. We received so many great questions. Obviously, we don't have the time to cover all of them in depth. I know we've already covered a couple of these during the course of the webinar. But um, just so everybody knows that um, we are using the, co the questions that we have not gotten to or we will not get to to um, help focus our blog moving forward. But I'll get to that here in a second. But thanks again for sending all the questions. So Chris, maybe just we can start at the top of the first bullet point and just work our way down. Um, so tips for monitoring reputation slash best practices. And I'm going to preempt you real quick before, um, before you answer this question. But just to let everyone know, for those of you who do not have email and ACID, we do have a blacklisting tool within Campaign PreCheck that allows you to monitor your domain reputation. So you can check that every day. You could check it 10 times a day, which is, we, we encourage, you know, constant checking because you just don't, you're not going to know when it, when it changes, when your reputation changes. But, um, but that is one tool that you can use. Chris, what else? What are some other um, areas or places where they can go to monitor the reputation or best practices? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, quite a few um, places, you know, again, we've talked about 250 OK, Return Path, um, eData Source is another one. Um, these, these, these companies, they essentially have seed lists or panel data that will help you see, hey, um, are my emails landing in the inbox or junk folder and maybe why, right? Uh, reputation sources, there's a lot of them that are out there on the inter internet. Some people may refer to things like sender score. Um, you know, there's, there's B2B ones too as well. Um, there's multiple places. People even use MX Toolbox to look at their reputation, see if they're on a blacklist. Um, it really depends upon, too, what's happening within your email program. I often tell marketers that the best source of data that they have are, is the data within their ESP, the reports. Uh, oftentimes, you can marry that with p uh, places like Google Analytics. So if you've got that integrated with your, you know, a UTM code within your campaign, that's also a good place to look. Um, but then to also look at your bounces. 
if you have an ESP that provides you with bounce details, they actually tell you the reason why the email bounced. That is gold. The reason I say it's gold is you can export that to a CSV or an XLS format and then sort that and look, look for places like your IP is blocked because of reputation. Oftentimes they give you a link, you click on that link, it will look at your reputation and then there's a form oftentimes that you can fill out to say, hey, um, I think that I was, this is not you know, calculated correctly, here's what I've done or here's what I'm doing to improve, can you please work with me to help me get off this blacklist or help me improve my reputation because it is you know, uh, going downhill. So I think those are some good places to do so. Uh, and again, never hang your hat on one reputation source. Um, you know, oftentimes people will say things like, um, well, my open rate is 2%, but my sender score is a 99, right? I hear that a lot. And, you know, again, from my perspective, like a sender score is one methodology of monitoring reputation. There's multiple places, but your ESP or marketing automation provider is going to have that gold when it comes to the reporting. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next, when warming up a new IP address, is it typical to expect open rates to be extremely low due to ISP's tendency to assign to spam unrecognized senders? Yes. Um, short answer is yes. But what happens is when you get a new IP address, uh, when you move from one ESP to another, you are going to be assigned a new, e uh, new IP address. Uh, it, it's probably brand new. As if it's dedicated and you have to do the warming, it's going to be brand new or not have any reputation for a period of time and you have to warm that up. Uh, I often have marketers uh, move the, um, if they are using one sending domain in one ESP to see if they can also use that same sending domain and the next ESP just so that, that way the domain reputation transfers. Oftentimes that's not possible due to DNS record conflicts, but you know, ask for that if you are doing, if you are going through an IP warming process. Uh, places like Gmail, like Microsoft, uh, will put things in the junk folder, um, essentially just because they want to see what people are going to do, right? They, they'll sprinkle a little bit into the junk folder. Are people going into the junk folder marking you as not spam? Are they looking for your email? Um, we do see open rates to be lower at certain ISPs. Again, oftentimes it's Gmail, uh, maybe Outlook. Um, but then uh, we, we also see them spike way up. So if the open rates do go down a little bit, it's important to keep with the IP warming plan that you've worked on either with a deliverability person or an, or an ESP. Stick with the plan. Uh, don't stop unless there's truly a major issue because ISPs want to see consistency. Mm -hmm. If you get a brand new IP address and you send and then you stop and then you send again and then you stop, that's typical of spammer behavior. And so having the consistency, not just with the volume during the warming period, but volume over the course of your marketing program is very important because ISPs do look at that. Perfect. No, excellent. Thanks. Uh, I think we've already covered the sec the third bullet point. Our ESP uses a shared IP, and uh, it, it is likely this causing deliver. I mean, yes. If if I guess if and we talked we we talked about this quite a bit at length. Um, if you are sharing an IP with with others who are dragging down the reputation, that could absolutely be causing deliverability issues, and it could be. It's not a small issue. I mean, it could be a large factor, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it's important that if you are on a shared IP address, you know, what other senders are there and are you consistently getting blacklisted? Are you consistently, you know, having block issues? And if so, it could be due to other senders that are on that shared IP. Yep. So Chris, a question here. So let's say I am on a shared IP and I go to my ESP and say, Hey, would you send me a list that who we're sharing with? Is it common practice for them to share that information? They won't tell you other senders, but they'll tell you, oftentimes they'll tell you categories of other senders, right? So other people in the travel space, other people in the, you know, uh, consumer retail business, right? So they'll tell you categories. They won't tell you the actual sender. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think, but then you can sort of go from there, at least try to do some investigation. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Uh, what are the best practices for staying current on trends in email and email deliverability? So I guess they're really looking for where's a good place to go um, to, to keep up with everything. Uh, you know, I would say, um, you know, the email and acid blog is great. Uh, the Trendline blog, we, we just uh, we just posted a, a blog on GDPR. Uh, we just did a finished a video on CCPA. Uh, we're doing a lot of blogging on Gmail, and we're doing a lot on B two B too as well. Uh, those are definitely very good. Uh, another one too is I wrote a book last year uh, called Deliverability Inferno. Uh, I'm actually working on part two uh, because there's again in deliverability things change all the time. 
uh, you know, there's, there's lots of new updates, uh, lots of things are happening in the space. And so those are really good places to go. Um, you know, blogs such as 250 OK, uh, Return Path, they have blogs as well. Um, you know, there's, you know, again, staying up to speed, not just on deliverability, but also email marketing trends is important uh, because again, if things change in like the content world, if things change, let's say again with Outlook, uh, each ISP has their own blog, right? So Gmail has their own, Microsoft has their own. It's important to look at those just so that that way you can be on the, you know, up and up as to what's happening when they do make changes. No, that's good. And actually in my next slide, I have some resources, including the Trendline blog, the email and asset blog, et cetera. But it, it basically just checking out the blogs of the big players in the space. Uh, absolutely. Uh, do non-openers in the list affect deliverability? How about inactive emails? And then this is sort of a three-part, two-part question, but I think we've already really covered it for the most part. What about low send frequency? Can this actually improve deliverability or reputation? Now, I think the biggest thing is, again, from, you know, non-openers do affect, inactives do affect. I think it's just the, the, the case of how often this is happening, right? So not every person on your list is always going to open your email. Not every person is always going to click. It's just looking at, you know, are you hitting them with too many emails? Are you not hitting them with enough emails? Are you not sending them the emails they signed up for? You know, about 10 years ago, the number one reason that people would complain uh, about an email is because they didn't sign up for it. The number one reason people complain in 2019 is they received too many emails, right? So in, right. in 2019, every recipient in the United States says, you know what, if I give my email address, I know I'm going to be emailed, right? If I drop my you know, business card in the fishbowl, I know I'm going to be emailed. It's a matter of, you know, being email drunk, right? Receiving too many emails. That's when people start to really, you know, hone back. They don't open, they don't click. They just delete you without reading you, reading your emails. They hit the spam button, they hit the unsubscribe button. That is definitely problematic, right? So again, frequency, as I mentioned before, is important. Having a good consistent sending frequency after your IP warming program is key. It helps deliverability because if you start to like send, drop, send, drop without any sort of consistency, you know, the ISPs are going to say, you know, is this, has this IP address been hacked? You know, what are they doing? Having some consistency, whether that means having a few programs on one IP address, three programs, uh, and again, that, that's, this is taken out of, out of consideration for transactional because transactional, of course, you are going to have low send frequency because of things like just receipts, yes. any sort of transaction data. That I'd say is a little bit different, but from a bulk marketing perspective, again, consistency and send frequency, um, you know, again, just from a sender score perspective, right? If you look, were to look at a sender score chart and if you notice that your sending frequency is slowed way down, you'll see your sender score drop, right? right? So again, there's multiple ways that you can impact that by having that consistency. Yeah, and I mean, taking trans, transactional out of the out of the equation and just talking about, uh, it's about getting that good cadence, right? The, the really fine tuning that cadence based on your industry. There's so many factors that play into that. There are. Um, so, how do we better communicate to customers who are inadvertently blocked, bounced, to help remedy disconnects in communication? So, I have a about eight years ago, I worked for an ESP, and one of our clients would actually call every recipient who bounced and I thought that, that was the most interesting thing I've, in the world right and I'm like how do you know these people right and of course he's like I've got a relationship with everybody on my list and I call and figure out why did it bounce um, I think the biggest thing with this is you know again if you're working with an ESP that they do provide you with bounce details and bounce logs oftentimes you can quickly clean up a lot of the bounces by again unblocks uh, you know, filling out forms, working with the deliverability team to help them unblock you at places like Barracuda or Comcast or, you know, any of those places that you can, uh, you know, the block be removed. And then look at places like, you know, a blacklist issue, right? Why did you get on a blacklist? Was it you that landed yourself in the blacklist? Um, and I always recommend before you contact a blacklist or before you contact an ISP, look to see what you did, if it was your fault, how you can improve, what you are doing to change, and put that plan together because you're going to have to, you know, come up with that plan during your conversation with the ISP filtering company or blacklist. Um, they're not just going to remove your IP or remove your domain because you asked nicely. It's going to be a series of, hey, you know what, I messed up, I sent to this older list, that got me on a blacklist, you know, I, we, we're not going to do this again, here's our plan moving forward, right? right. And so doing so is very important. You never reach out to an ISP, a blacklist, or a filter and say, remove me now, right? Because guess what? They're not going to remove you now. You're going to be one of the last ones if, <laughs> if, if they ever respond. 
right? It's very important to understand what you did, take a step back and figure that out. Um, and then, you know, again, from, a, from working with multiple customers, oftentimes it's due to, especially if you're a B2B sender, it could be due to the strictness or tightness of emails coming through that B2B filter. Uh, one easy way around it is to say, you know what, instead of giving me your business address, just give me your uh, consumer address that maybe you can check later or check on the weekends or if you're allowed to check during the day. Um, but if you do work with customers, maybe at a certain domain and you're not getting through, have a champion within that you know, network, if you do have a champion within there, set up a meeting with IT or the mail server administrator and get on a phone and help understand why the emails aren't getting through, especially if it's something that the recipients want. Um, and oftentimes it's due to things like you're sending too fast, right? We get that a lot, especially on the B2B side, right? Because these B2B domains have a few mail servers where Gmail's got you know, thousands, right? So if you're sending too much too fast, it looks like you're trying to attack that mail server. And so they just shut you down. So what can you do to improve it? Well, you send slower or you chop it up over the course of a week or three days or something like that. So lots of different um, success stories there, but it's important to um, you know, understand sort of, did I make a mistake? Was there something that I changed that could have caused this? And if so, what's the plan moving forward? Yeah, you really have to be a detective to, to figure that, put all, put all the clues together to come up with a conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are so many different strategies. And I, I hate saying best practices because I hate that word. It's, all, it's always uh, solutions depending upon your business, right? So if you send this sure. much, maybe you need one IP address. If you send this much, maybe you need two, maybe you need 10. Uh, maybe you need one subdomain or three. Um, so it really depends upon what's happening. But again, there's different ways to, to go about this from a solutions perspective. Sure. Yeah, there's no one way for sure in this. Um, so it's so dependent on so many factors. Um, so I, I just put up the additional resources. Uh, there's the Trendline Interactive. Well, this is the deliverability URL, but um, I also spent a lot of time in the blog. I, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I was over there quite a bit, Chris, bringing myself up to speed. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Chris's book, Deliverability in, Inferno, um, helping email marketers understand the journey from purgatory to paradise is an amazing resource as is the email and acid blog. We do have deliverability um, blogs in there. And like I said earlier, uh, the questions that we did not get to today, we are using to help drive the blog moving forward. So everybody keep your eyes out um, for, for new deliverability focused blogs moving forward. And for those of you who are not customers, <laughs> shameless plug here, but try get in there and, and email and acid and sign up for a free trial. Try out the uh, spam tool and see how your email stacks up. You might be surprised. I mean, maybe the deliverability comes in at 100% and everything's great, or maybe not, but then you can go in and make adjustments and see how it affects your, your deliverability scores using our spam tool. Super helpful. So yeah, please, please give that a try. Um, we only have a couple minutes, so I want to close up here. Um, Chris, I'd like to thank, personally, thank you for taking the time to, to really dive into deliverability today. Sorry, I couldn't get your camera to work. I, I'm up here, just, here I am. <laughs> so, but that's all right. Well, I think the information um, stands for itself. That was the most important thing. So, so thanks again for taking the time out of your busy day to join us today. No, thank you. I really appreciate it. And look forward to uh, answering follow-up questions as well. Oh, I have some for you. Trust me. Um, and then everyone, uh, you know, hopefully everybody that joined the webinar today walks away with something that you can immediately apply to your email development that increases deliverability. That's what it's all about. Um, thanks again for joining everybody and, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye, guys.